It's uh, now time for the second talk of the morning, where uh, John is going to be telling us about how to use scales. Well, that, so that's not true. But uh, like, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I, I'm going to encourage us to think about about scales uh, as a way of encouraging us to think about measurement more broadly. Uh, and if by the end of the talk you think to yourself, scales are terrible, uh, then like like uh, it's not the case that I, I have like done my job right, but like I. I the point is to think about them critically in a, in a sort of way. So anyway, uh, Conrad and I thought that it would be good to get uh, what, what I call the, the dinosaur method out of the way first before other speakers regale us with their new and shiny methods of data collection. Uh, right, like I'm partly joking about this, I, but like I definitely think that there's still a big place uh, for traditional psychometric instruments. Um, and, but, but more importantly, I think that thinking about um, psychometric instruments might help us to design better instruments more broadly, um, regardless of what particular methods we end up using. Uh, so this talk is also going to be less practical than, than conceptual, and is in a way an extension of this, the second half of the previous talk. Uh, basically, I want us to think about um, what it is that we're doing when we're using self-report measures, uh, and then also especially what, what we're doing when we're evaluating self-report measures. And, and here, like, I mean quite a specific kind of self-report measure, which is the, the kind associated with psychologists rather than with sociologists. Um, so let's begin with the model we've already seen about what a belief might be, what beliefs might be. Um, so uh, so right, beliefs are a psychological construct, which is to say they're hypothetical entities that psychologists posit in our cognitive theories. Uh, broadly speaking, right, as we've seen earlier, most of us think that beliefs are subject to some input conditions and some, uh, and some output conditions, which may be affective, behavioral, or cognitive. Um, and there's some sense about what it feels like to believe something. Uh, the qualia of belief, if you're a philosopher. The feeling of truthiness, if you're a fan of Stephen Colbert. Um, we'll come back to uh, this larger model later. Uh, but let's focus on the output side of things, and especially on, on behavior, because that's what's relevant to measurement. Um, so here's a simple theory about the relationship between belief and behavior, um, which most psychologists, and actually kind of most people in the West, um, broadly ex accept, even if implicitly. Um, so, right, so th in the model, basically, beliefs cause behaviors given the relevant desires. Uh, we can complicate the model a bit more, of course. We can draw the causal arrows bi-directionally to acknowledge that behaviors might also change beliefs. We can add opportunity uh, to desire as another kind of moderating condition. Um, theorists of attitude like um, um, Ashgen and Fishbein or Russell Fazio have done something like this more formally. The point is that we, psychologists and people more broadly, um, basically, like we assume that there's a more or less reliable causal relationship between um, beliefs and, and behaviors. Uh, and so this is the sort of thing that Ayana was asking about um, earlier and, and we'll, we'll get to. So, so this is, as I say, Neil Van Leeuwen's favorite example, right? So the, the belief that there is milk in the fridge uh, in conjunction with the desire for milk uh, will lead us to going to the fridge to get the milk, for example. Um, or uh, more relevant for our purposes this morning, the belief that there is milk in the fridge will lead us to saying so, to saying that there's milk in the fridge when we're asked, given the desire to tell the truth, for example. Um, and this causal relation um, is the foundation for people, including psychologists, but also just regular people, inferring the contents of other people's mental states from their assertions, whether in everyday conversation or in structured interviews, or um, as in our case today, this morning, uh, a self-report questionnaire measure. So I want to encourage us to think that what we do when we give people questionnaires, what we do when we interview people, um, is not like of a totally different piece from what we do in everyday conversation. What we're doing is inferring mental states, inferring something invisible inside people's heads from external, visible, observable things like conversation um, and assertion and, and all the rest of it, that kind of behavior. Um, and and I, I am taking behavior in a kind of broad sense here to include verbal behavior, by which I mean speaking and writing, um, responding to questionnaires, uh, all that stuff counts as behavior. So uh, obviously this is very obvious. I, I, hope, I hope that what I've said so far is, is tremendously obvious. Uh, but, but what I want to emphasize is that we have a, like a fairly clear theory about how self-report measures work, right? And, and that's, that's what we think is going on most of the time. Um, I, I would say that the situation is probably quite different for more exotic measures, um, including uh, implicit measures or physiological measures. 
and the relationship between uh, the psychological construct, so belief in this case, uh, and the test scores in those cases, like implicit measures and physiological measures, is somewhat more opaque and perhaps more indirect than in, in the case of um, interviews and, and questionnaires. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that conversation to be had for, for other speakers uh, when they get to it. Uh, okay, so given that simple theory that we've just seen, we can now look at a sort of paradigmatic um, abstract example of a self-report item. So P here represents a sentence that expresses a proposition, and the participant is asked to indicate how strongly they agree or disagree with a proposition uh, on a scale uh, like, like this. Uh, here's a less abstract example from uh, my own scale called the supernatural belief scale. Uh, but before we go any further, I thought um, we might want to think a little bit about the rating scale in question, right? So negative four to four, classic Likert scale going from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and, and conversationally, right, we can, we can say that it indicates how, how strongly someone agrees or disagrees with the proposition in question. Um, but, but there's a further question of how we should translate this into sort of cognitive terms about the theorized psychological construct, right, the belief. Um, uh, and there is, as it turns out, uh, quite a large and not uncomplicated theoretical and empirical literature on the nature of attitudes and attitude strength. Um, so I happen to think that attitudes and beliefs are basically the same thing, uh, which is very convenient for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But less convenient is the fact that uh, different theorists do mean slightly different things by the term attitude strength. Uh, for some theorists, it indicates something about the qualia of belief uh, mentioned earlier. Strong agreement feels different from weak agreement or disagreement and maybe comes with different affective responses. Uh, for other theorists, it's about um, cognitive accessibility or salience, uh, which is to say strong beliefs come to mind more easily than weak ones. Uh, they are easily triggered, uh, you might say. Uh, so that's a claim about the relationship between the belief and its inputs, um, as we discussed earlier. Um, other theorists focus on the outputs. So strong beliefs are, in this case, uh, those that are more likely to, believe, to lead to belief consistent behavior, um, and, and so forth, right? So different, different theorists about attitude strength conceptualize what attitude strength is in, in slightly different and sometimes mutually contradictory uh, ways. Um, so, uh, I, so I don't really have a view on which, which way of conceptualizing attitude strength is the best way, but the fact that I don't have a view on this should be troubling to me, uh, because it basically implies that I don't know what we're doing when, hmm. when, when I give people scales like, like this one, right? I don't know what we're measuring. If, it, to the extent that I don't know what attitude strength is, then I don't know what we're doing when we're giving people response, uh, response scales like that one. Uh, okay, so that, that's, a, that's an aside in some ways, like a very kind of critical aside, um, but, but an aside nevertheless. Uh, okay, so here's a, uh, an abstract causal model very similar to the ones you've seen already that uh, describes what might be happening when someone responds to a single item. The belief leads uh, causally to uh, their response to the single item. So someone has a belief uh, and it causes her to respond to that item in a questionnaire in, in a particular kind of way. Consequently, we can observe her response and make an inference about her mental state, um, her belief, its content and its strength. Uh, I've said something about strength already. Uh, content is also more complicated uh, than it seems. Um, so and this is related to something that Ayana asked um, uh, uh, after the, pre the previous talk. So the most straightforward way to interpret someone's response to this item is that it indicates something about her belief in an entity we might call God. Um, but maybe weirdly, this is not really how psychologists think about items like this one. Um, as I understand it, it is how sociologists and political scientists do think about items like this one, but psychologists seem to like to complicate matters, uh, uh, and you might end up deciding that we overcomplicate matters, which is fine, uh, and then that might persuade you that you should be sociologists or political scientists instead, uh, and if so, I, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, but what psychologists want to do, it seems, is to get at some broader set uh, uh, of beliefs and attitudes uh, and to do so, we measure people's responses to multiple items, right? So the traditional self-report measure in psychology is a multi-item uh, measure. Uh, so this is the supernatural belief scale. Uh, I'm plugging my own work here, right? <laughs> uh, there are 10 items, uh, and, but, but the conceit uh, 
I write, sorry, the ten I just write, some of them are about God, some of them are about the devil, some of them are about souls, and so forth. Um, and, and it's clear from this, from just looking at the set of items, it's clear that, that our interpretation of the, f of the first item, that somehow it's, it's about measuring belief in God, um, really only applies to the first item. Right? It doesn't apply to any of the other items, uh, except maybe the last one, which also mentions um, God. So clearly, then, um, then what we're not trying to measure is belief in God. We're trying to measure something else. And, and, and it's that something else that's a bit kind of unclear. Right? So, uh, so there, there's no like, particular belief that this measure taken as a whole measures. It seems that, uh, it seems that instead, um, what the supernatural belief scale uh, measures is a kind of disposition to believe in stuff like God and the devil and angels and demons and that sort of thing. So it's not a measure of belief at all, right? In that sense, it's a measure of a, like a, a, a tendency to believe in particular things. Um, and, and what you will find in the psychological literature is that lots of psychological, lots of psychological measures are like this, right? Like we, they're not measures of particular attitudes, but measures of broader tendencies to form particular attitudes, or they're not measures of particular beliefs, they're measures of dispositions to, to express or form um, particular beliefs. Now, um, this might seem uh, needlessly complicated, as I said earlier, uh, but let me try to give two reasons that motivate psychologists uh, in their obsession with multi-item measures. Uh, the first has to do with something we call reliability, and the second has to do with something we call uh, multi-dimensionality. Um, so the first motivation behind multi-item measures uh, is, uh, is, is, is perhaps best described as a kind of hedging, right? Um, okay, so uh, here's the idea. The belief that P, uh, right, um, is potentially causally related to a whole host of different behaviors. So, uh, for example, the belief that there is milk in the fridge um, is, is potentially causally related to um, to you know, asserting that there's milk in the fridge, or betting that there's milk in the fridge, or walking to the fridge to get milk, uh, and so forth. Uh, but given the presence of the belief in any given subject, um, the, the presence of any given behavior is contingent on some other factors, uh, which we've already uh, looked at abstractly, such as the relevant desires, or opportunities, or, or motivations, or whatever. So for example, you might believe that there's milk in the fridge, but you might also object morally to betting and therefore lack the relevant desire uh, for your belief to produce betting behavior, right? And, but what that means is, is if, uh, as a means of assessing your belief, I only asked you whether you were willing to bet me a fiver that there's milk in the fridge, and you say no, uh, I will be mistaken in inferring from your response that you lack the belief that there is milk in the fridge. But without knowing your views on gambling beforehand, uh, I also can't know beforehand whether or not that's going to be a good measure um, of, your, of your belief. So what I can do is I can look for different behavioral clues uh, from which I can then infer something about your beliefs, each of which might indicate something about your belief about whether or not, for example, there's milk um, in the fridge. And unless I'm so unlucky that all the behaviors I chose to observe were misleading, um, I, I should have a better chance of inferring the right mental states than if I only picked one kind of behavior to observe, for example, betting behavior, um, etc. This is basically the principle of diversifying your investment portfolio, but applied to psychometrics, right? So th that's why I call it um, hedging for reliability. Uh, so right, again, the basic idea is the mental state produces a bunch of behaviors, but it doesn't produce any of these behaviors infallibly. Therefore, you want to sample various, uh, various kinds of behaviors to be able to, to make a, a, a more reliable global assessment of the mental states. In the psychometric case, um, all the behaviors are, are kind of the same kind of behavior, uh, which are responses to questionnaire items. So we're already li limiting ourselves to a particular class of behaviors, all of which basically involve reading sentences and rating your agreement um, to the sentence. Now, besides just hedging for reliability, multi-item questionnaires also allow us to evaluate how reliable a scale is. Um, so here's a six item measure, right, abstractly conceived, and then you can divide the six item measure into two sets um, of items, say even number and odd numbered um, items in your questionnaire. The, reliabil the reliability literature goes back to Charles Spearman in the early 20th century, 
um, who, who was originally really talking about the correspondence between two parallel tests rather than two halves of one test. Uh, but it's been since applied to think about tests in split half ways, right? So you can take one test and, and cleave it in twain and then correlate the responses with one another. Um, uh, so eventually, uh, so, so that's how originally we did split half reliability, just took a test and literally split it in half and, and looked for correlations between the two. Um, by the time we got to the middle of the century, um, people realized, wait a second, you know, maybe, like, what if the way we're dividing the test into halves is also biased in some way? Shouldn't we look at every possible combination of split halves right, and correlate them with one another and then like, basically average them right, to, um, uh, to, to get one score? So, so that's where Cronbach's alpha basically comes from. Right? It's, it's basically the split half correlational test but like multiply it by the number of possible combinations. Um, uh, so, like, so for example, with my 10 item measure, the supernatural belief scale, I believe there are 126 possible iterations. Uh, so you take 126 correlations and then you average them uh, and then you get Cronbach's alpha, um, essentially. Um, now, it, it didn't take long for statisticians to realize that this is a terrible way to, to do it, right? Because um, <laughs> obviously, Averages, by which I mean means as opposed to medians, are are, are like very strongly affected by by skewed data. Um, so uh, so so you, you you will very often over or underestimate the reliability of your scale if you just take the the the, the kind of raw average across all possible uh, split half correlations. Uh, so since 1951, basically statisticians have like come up with like million like dozens of ways to correct for various biases that you get from Cronbach's, um, from Cronbach's alpha. I'm not going to bore you with like how uh, different statisticians have tried to do this. Uh, there are quite a few good papers about this already, which you can ask me about after the talk. Um, they're all basically ways to deal with, with variance, um, essentially. Um, anyway, the, the point is that Cronbach's alpha is not amazing, but remains by quite a long shot the most common measure of what we call internal reliability. Um, the, um, the main problem, I think, with, with alpha, with Cronbach's alpha, is not really that it's, it's, easy, it's easy to skew, right? So the, the main problem uh, with alpha is that it basically assumes um, what we call unidimensionality. It assumes that there is one psychological construct okay. um, driving all the item responses. And, and then what it does is assesses how well the collection of items performs given that assumption. But of course the assumption could be false, right? So, so proper nerds uh, prefer explicitly constructing and testing measurement models for multi-item scales through, for example, structure equation modeling. Uh, now, here's an abstract diagram of a unidimensional model, which should look familiar from, from earlier, right? So here's one construct driving um, responses to all the, the items in a scale. Um, right, you can turn this into a structure equation model uh, quite easily, which is basically a series of regressions. Um, and then you can test the model for how well it fits the actual data. You can compare um, its model fit, for example, um, with a competing model um, of what's going on in your data. For example, this one, uh, in which there are two underlying constructs driving the responses to the same, to the same scale. Um, uh, and, and therefore, this would not no longer be a unidimensional measure. It would be a, a sort of multidimensional measure. Oh, so I should say something about model fit um, and, and what that means in this context. So, uh, so a model, uh, right, like like this one or this one, uh, a model is just an abstract description, right, of a statistical relationship of the statistical relationships um, between variables. Uh, and any given model can then be compared to actual real life data and evaluated against that data. So in our case, we can take our two models, unidimensional uh, and, uh, and multidimensional, to see if, um, if either of these models actually fits the data that we collect uh, from the real world. Um, you, will, you will not be pleased, uh, I think, to hear that statisticians have come up with a whole bunch of indicators of model fit, uh, and there is no best one. Uh, there's not even very strong consensus on how to categorize different uh, indicators of model fit. Uh, so uh, here is like my idiosyncratic um, uh, way of carving up uh, statistical nature at its joints. Um, according to, to me, I guess, there are uh, absolute fit indices and relative fit indices. Uh, a relative fit index uh, tests your model against a null model, 
uh, which is one usually in which all the items in a scale don't correlate with one another uh, at all. Uh, and then absolute fit indices don't do that. Uh, they're basically ratios of various kinds internal to the, to the data um, itself. Uh, so here are some examples right, of, of, of absolute and relative fit indices that you might see in a paper that involves all construct validity. Uh, and I think that's right. right? There, is, there, is, there is overlap between these two ideas. Um, and, and I think that internal reliability analysis is a kind of part of construct validity. Uh, but before we get to, to that, there are also other kinds of reliability that may be worth considering in any given case. Uh, the first is quite straightforward, uh, which is test, retest reliability. I say it's straightforward, but people sometimes forget that test, retest reliability is only really important if we assume that the construct in question is stable. Yeah. Right? So we usually assume this as psychologists. So, so we're okay most of the time. But sometimes we assume that, for example, beliefs are stable on rather shaky empirical and theoretical grounds. I mean, like, why should we think that, for example, the belief that God exists is a stable part of any individual's mind, like a part of their personality or something? Maybe it comes and goes. Maybe it ebbs and flows. Maybe it's context specific. Um, and if so, why should we assume that a measure of religious belief or supernatural belief should enjoy high test retest reliability? Um, we shouldn't, right, uh, in the absence of this assumption. Um, which is to say that uh, whether or not test retest reliability is important depends on our theories about the belief in question. As it happens, very few people gather the longitudinal data required to assess test retest reliability anyway, so maybe this is all moot point. Uh, but we should probably do it more to the extent that we assume that these beliefs are stable. Uh, the other kind of reliability I want to say something about is reliability across groups or across contexts. Uh, so say we find a scale, right? And say that we see from the paper that a unidimensional model fits the scale well. Uh, great, okay. So what we might do now is we might use the scale um, and assume that it just is a, uni a unidimensional measure, right? Uh, but this would be unjustified because it may well be that a unidimensional model fits the data collected from one group and context, but not uh, when, when, when you're looking at data from another group and context. So that's just a way of saying that a measure might behave unidimensionally in some contexts and in some groups, but not others. And what this might mean is that uh, ostensibly the same, superficially the same measure might be measuring slightly different things in different populations or situations. So it's important to work out how robust a measurement model is across populations, say across different countries or different religious traditions or something like that. And the best thing to do, right, is probably to always run a confirmatory factor analysis to check that the measurement uh, model fit, fits every time you use a scale. But failing that, it's probably best to use scales that are demonstrably robust across groups. I, I say failing that. I mean, these days, computationally, there, there's really not that much of an excuse not to run a confirmatory factor analysis. It's so easy to do, right? Like our computers, like, you know, like I, I think someone once told me that we have enough, we have more computing power in our cell phones than it took to send a man on, to put a man on the moon. Like, you know, it, it isn't like 1995 anymore. We can now do CFAs like very easily within seconds uh, on our computers. Anyway, uh, okay, so that's reliability. Um, on to validity. Uh, so lots of people say, and you, you may have, taught, you may have, um, have heard this as undergraduates, mm -hmm. that there are different kinds of validity, right? Like face validity and construct validity and convergent validity and divergent validity. So like, obviously this is not crazy uh, as a view, but I think it is messy and, and probably misguided most of the time. So I'm just gonna talk about validity as like one thing. Um, okay, so you will, you will now not be surprised to hear that people disagree about what validity is. Um, you will often hear people say that a test is valid to the extent that it accurately measures what it purports to measure. And like, that's not a bad start as a definition of validity, I guess. Um, more stringently, we might say that a test is valid if um, the theoretical causal model we began with uh, here 
is, is true, right? So it's a claim about, about a, a causal model, which is to say um, a claim about how a construct drives um, particular item responses. Okay, uh, so maybe more important for our purposes uh, than the definition of validity is uh, the question of how we might evaluate the validity of a scale. Uh, so here we're back to, uh, to, to our simple causal theory about belief and its behavioral outputs. Uh, sorry, again, the construct belief drives the behavior which we capture in our questionnaires um, as item responses. Uh, but of course, uh, most of us also think that the belief also uh, drives other behaviors which are not captured uh, in, our, in our questionnaire. Um, and, and if that's true, what this allows us to see is, is, is whether or not our item responses, say our scale scores, um, predict uh, these other behaviors that are not included um, in our scale uh, to the extent that those behaviors are measurable. Um, and if, if you do find a sort of you know, robust, reliable, positive correlation, then we might have some evidence to say that our measure is, is valid. Uh, and and all, all, all that is saying is that it behaves, the measure behaves in a way that you would expect, given the simple causal model that we're assuming. Uh, so again, uh, right, so again, uh, behavior includes verbal behaviors, which includes responses to other questionnaires, um, as well as our own. So, so this is where um, like construct validity uh, and, and convergent validity become very similar things, right? So if you look at other behaviors, and you don't, you're not just thinking of like going to church or something, but also you're thinking of responses to other similar questionnaires, then what you can look at is the correlation between two purportedly similar questionnaires that, that, that allegedly measure the same, the same construct. Okay, um, you might think it odd that I keep going on and on about the sort of causal model um, that describes the relationship between the construct and its inputs, outputs, and phenomenology. Um, so like, obviously, I, like, I do think it matters, right, that we have a sort of causal model at the back of our minds, uh, and, and I should say something about why I think it matters. Um, you might recall the distinction uh, made earlier between realism and operationism. Um, and this, uh, again, is the distinction between two philosophies of measurement. The first uh, asserts that there exists some latent variable uh, to be measured for which we designed uh, measurement instruments. Right? Uh, now, the second uh, denies that such a latent variable exists and asserts instead that the manifest variable is just a summary of the methods of measurement. This is obviously related to uh, realism and constructivism in the philosophy of science. Some philosophers argue that uh, unobservable entities uh, like quarks and gluons exist, uh, and that our instruments try to detect these things that exist, quarks and gluons. Um, other philosophers of science and some physicists argue that um, that things like quarks and gluons are just man uh, are mathematical fictions um, that just make it easier for us to think about our theories and the relationship to, to empirical evidence. Um, the, the approach I'm taking, I've been taking for, for most of the day, uh, is decidedly realist. Uh, but as I said at the end of the first talk, my agenda is not really to persuade you to be a realist, so much as to persuade you to work out what your view is in any given case of measurement. Um, you can be a realist um, in general terms about science or even uh, about psychology more broadly uh, without being a realist about a whole host of particular psychological constructs, including supernatural beliefs. Now, intimately related to this question of realism and operationism is the distinction between a scale uh, and an index, right? Uh, so here are two examples that I take to be uncontroversial. Um, to the extent that performance on the sorts of things you see on the left-hand side are correlated with one another, running, push-ups, basketball, football, swimming, etc. Uh, to the extent that, that performance on these activities are, are positively correlated, I think most people would agree that there's probably some underlying trait that accounts for this correlation. Uh, we might call this trait general fitness, right? Uh, and we might theorize about what general fitness is. Uh, maybe it has something to do with like our, muscul our like musculoskeletal makeup. It, it may have a neurocognitive component uh, and so forth. We might even try to figure out um, the sort of evolutionary and developmental history of, uh, of something called general fitness. Right? So, so that, that might be how you think about the items on the left-hand side. In contrast, very few people will want to call um, socioeconomic status a latent variable in the same way. 
um, as like an invisible causal force inside of a person. Um, rather, someone's socioeconomic status is just a summary of things like their income, education level, and so forth. Um, the positive correlations among these variables is not driven by a single underlying cause, unless we mean something like the exploitation of labor by capital or something like that. Um, rather, these different things on the right-hand side kind of explain each other, right? So a person's occupation, for example, might explain to some extent their income uh, and their highest education level might explain in part their occupation uh, and, and so forth. Um, so here, in this case on the right-hand side, it will make no sense to try to investigate the nature of socioeconomic status or its evolutionary and developmental history. Um, there is nothing to investigate about socioeconomic status per se because socioeconomic status per se does not exist. It's not a thing. Um, now, what this comparison tells us is that our interpretations of our measures can send us in quite different research directions, opening up some questions for inquiry and closing others. Or put more strongly, our interpretations of our measures have implications for what research projects even make sense to do um, and which are incoherent wastes of time. And as researchers, what could be more important than that? Mm. Um, there are more mundane practical implications as well. The most salient example, at least to me, maybe less salient to you, is the difference between uh, principal components analysis and factor analysis, which are often treated interchangeably but do have different assumptions baked in. Uh, PCA is appropriate for indices, uh, but arguably much less so for scales uh, and, and vice versa for factor analysis. Um, and there are also conceptual implications, for example, how we think about validity. So far, I've been asserting that what makes an instrument valid is that some causal story is true, such that a latent construct drives item responses. Now, obviously, if what we have is an index and not the scale, this sense of validity simply does not apply. Some other definition of validity is required. Um, we might be back at a more pragmatic approach according to which validity just is usefulness operationalized in terms of predictive power or something like that. Um, okay, and I IQ testing, again, uh, provides a convenient example closer to home. Um, as I mentioned in a previous talk, the orthodox interpretation of IQ tests like the Weschler's or Standard Binet or Stanford Binet or Raven's progressive matrices is that they're all indicators of a latent variable, the psychological construct called G or general intelligence or general cognitive ability. Um, this is meant to be analogous to general fitness, uh, which we have just seen. This interpretation of intelligence testing has led to a lot of theoretical speculation about the nature of G. For example, many theorists argue that G is something like mental speed, uh, whatever that means. Um, it has also led to a lot of work on the genetic causes of G and even work on the evolution of G. A lot of time and money has been spent on projects like these. But this picture of IQ testing might be mistaken it's still possible that there is no G. It's possible that the various components of IQ tests, fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence, and so forth, are strictly speaking independent, but mutually cause one another, much like um, the different indicators of socioeconomic status. It's possible that the positive correlations between IQ tests are explained by overlaps in the cognitive processes involved in the testing itself, rather than indicating an underlying general cognitive ability um, at all. Researchers still disagree about this, and these disagreements can to some extent be empirically adjudicated, which is to say that our assumptions about what we're measuring and how we are measuring um, these things are themselves scientific theories amenable to empirical test. So far, we have focused on the output side of scale validation, looking at what people variously call convergent and predictive validity. But our simple causal model also has room for an input side, and this too can be, pro can be brought to play for scale validation. Uh, if, for example, our theories tell us that exposure to credibility-enhancing displays strengthens supernatural belief, then if we find that such displays do shift scores on our measure, 
then we can be that much more confident that our measure tracks supernatural belief. Now, it becomes clear that the testing of psychometric theories about our measures and the testing of substantive theories about our constructs are intimately tied together. Um, this is just a consequence of the latentness of psychological constructs, which cannot be directly observed, but only indirectly inferred. Okay, I hope I've managed to persuade you to take measurement seriously as a theoretical enterprise, and not just a straightforward means to collect data to test your favorite hypotheses. It's hard to measure stuff well in psychology, and maybe it's even harder to know when we have done so, but that's all the more reason to think clearly about and deeply about measurement. Uh, so I'll end now with some more practical remarks. Uh, some of you are going to be tempted to invent your own measures in the way that philosophers are often tempted to invent their own definitions, uh, though God only knows why in both those cases. Uh, and for science's sake, you should think about what you want to measure. Like, what is the construct you need to measure given your theory? Um, now, in my experience, uh, as, a, as a reviewer, as like a, a, like a lecturer, right, um, very few people think about the construct that they're measuring. They just measure and then worry about the theory later on. This seems to me to be um, a mistake. But once you have figured out what the construct is that you want to measure, you can then go hunting to see if there is already an existing measure out there, uh, and there, there probably is. Uh, so Pete Hill and Ralph Hood, back in 1999, uh, gathered together and reviewed like nearly 200 measures of religiosity. Then a few years ago, for my sins, uh, I got recruited by them to do an update of the book, and, and our, our like psych info search first turned up over 600 measures of religiosity and spirituality, and then we kind of winnowed it down to only 322, um, which will come out in the new edition of, of the book, um, uh, which will be open access, so you'll be able to find it quite easily when it comes out. Um, there are all sorts of things in this book, um, uh, which, which isn't at all exhaustive, uh, but we had to stop somewhere. Um, and it's with, it's with the publishers now, so it'll, it'll come out soon. So this is the kind of thing that we've included in, in the book, right? We found unidimensional and multidimensional measures of religiosity and, and spirituality. We found measures of what you might call religious and spiritual orientation, which are ways of being religious, even if levels of religiosity are the same. Uh, we found measures of all kinds of, of, of religious um, and spiritual beliefs and attitudes. Uh, we found a few measures of behavior. Um, with, uh, and, and et cetera, right? So th there were hundreds and hundreds of, of measures um, uh, for psychologists of religion and spirituality to, to mine um, already. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, it's open access, so you have no excuse anymore uh, to, to, to like, keep inventing measures uh, beyond necessity. Um, uh, there's a website called the, the Association for Religion Data Archive. So I think it's the ARDA, A -R -D -A com, and it's run by sociologists uh, in America, uh, and we're, we've been working with them to put our measures, these measures, up on their website. So, so all that will be kind of like free to use eventually. So again, you, you have run out of excuses to, uh, so stop inventing measures, basically. But okay, fine. Like, let's, say, let's say that you don't find exactly what you want. Uh, we all have this. Researchers, uh, being narcissists, um, uh, have this conceit that what we are interested in is special, and therefore, no one could, possi could possibly have already invented a measure that is directly tailored to the thing that we're interested in because we're so unique and special and like Jesus loves us or something. Uh, so, so what you will want to do now, if you, if you believe this, if you believe you're special, uh, is you will want to come up with a whole bunch of items, right? Like, like many more items than you think you need, right? That, that capture your construct, uh, regardless of whether it's a unidimensional uh, construct or a multidimensional construct. Um, and and I, say, I, say, I say that because our intuitions about what constitutes a good measure uh, might, be, might be wrong, and are often are wrong. Um, I think every time I've invented a scale, uh, I, I write the most obvious item as the first item, right? And then, and then, I, and then I collect like, data from hundreds of people, and I almost always kick out the first item. Uh, even though, to me, that was the most obvious way to ask the question. And, like, and I have no idea why. Right? I don't have any intuitions about why 
often that's the weakest item when you look at the structure equation model or like a reliability analysis. So, so, like, so come up with lots and lots of items and then collect the data on them and then you can kind of like iterate and kick out um, items on the basis of how they perform in a factor analysis or something um, like this. Um, as it turns out that um, uh, if you have a unidimensional construct, uh, you probably don't need too many final items in your scale. Um, there's no real consensus statistically about how, many, about how many items is a good number of items for any given dimension or construct. I tend to think three or four items per dimension or construct is actually probably adequate uh, for, the, for, hedging, for hedging purposes. Right, but obviously, if your if your construct is multidimensional, then then you'll need like three or four items per dimension within within the broader construct. So that might give you a much larger scale. I think that the trend in psychology in like the 70s and 80s and 90s was to have these like ginormous scales, right, of like 100 items, so like 60 items. Um, and IQ tests are, are still like this, right? They take like two hours to do. But but I think that that that. That was like a, a weird ritual, right? Like people no, no longer really think that we have any reason to think that a hundred items is what you need to measure a construct, which is why Raven's progressive matrices, uh, you, you, there are versions of it that contain like 12 tasks, right? Like, and so it takes like a few minutes to do as opposed to a traditional IQ test that takes two hours. Um, but the G loading is high and all the rest of it. So, so, right, so you might only need uh, three or four items per, per dimension or, or construct. Um, okay, so, uh, I, I, like, I, I will say that there is a spectrum of multidimensionality. Uh, I think uh, we often think of multidimensionality as like one kind of thing, but I think that there, there's a case to, to distinguish between two kinds of multidimensionality. So there's a strong sense of multidimensionality in which the different factors or subscales uh, are only weakly or, uh, or even if strongly, they're only contingently correlated with one another. Um, but there's also a, a much weaker sense of multidimensionality in which the different factors um, are correlated with one another, uh, but for some like structural reason, right? For some like strong underlying reason. Um, so, so some personality scales uh, might be uh, a bit like this. The items uh, of 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 all all the items within a within a, a single uh, personality scale might get at the same disposition, uh, but but they are asked across different social domains, right? So if you if you if you believe the theory of personality that any given personality trait is, is essentially an if-then statement, right? Where, where you have if P, where P is some social situation, then Q, where Q is some set of behaviors, um, then you might, you might think that you might need um, like lots of different items to capture the personality trait because you need to capture the different social situations in which the trait might, might manifest itself. So that's a weak sense of multidimensional. It's just multi-contextual rather than multidimensional per se. Okay, uh, and, and actually, the, the supernatural belief scale, uh, which I talked about earlier, is also arguably multidimensional in that sense, where you can look at the underlying uh, responses, you can look at the, 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 the underlying structure beneath the responses and see that um, some of the items are more strongly correlated with one another, but there is nevertheless still a, a superordinate underlying construct, supernatural belief um, underlying all of them. So it's, it's a bit multidimensional, but it's essentially unidimensional. Or, or so that paper uh, I wrote 10 years ago argues. I'm not sure I believe this anymore, but never mind. Um, okay, so come up with your items, right? Uh, lots of lots of items, and then collect a bunch of data. Uh, and then you can start eliminating uh, items, retaining the best items and rejecting the worst ones. Uh, again, this is easier if you think that your construct is unidimensional, and if you're right about that. Uh, but, but also it's not too difficult, not too complicated, if, even if your construct happens to be multidimensional. Basically, you select items based on uh, your internal reliability tests uh, or your exploratory factor, anal factor analysis or your CFAs. You keep the items that load well and you ditch the items that don't load well. Um, people disagree about how much psychometric evaluation can and should be done from a single data set. Uh, but the more data you collect in any given sitting, the more you can do, because you can obviously split your data set randomly into different chunks, and you can perform your exploratory data analysis on one chunk and your confirmatory, your confirmatory factor analysis in, on another chunk. Um, but let's assume that you didn't collect lots and lots of data in the first place. Uh, what, you will, what you will want to do now is collect uh, more data um, just using the final items that you want to retain in your final, in your final measure.
right? Uh, so, so with this data, uh, which only looks at the final items in your scale, you can run your confirmatory factor analyses, testing your hypothetical measurement model. Uh, so for example, uh, 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 um, a, uh, an essentially unidimensional measurement model. Um, you should probably test between different measurement models to test your hypotheses. Uh, uh, so that um, you know, it's not just you, you, so you're not just testing your favorite model because your favorite model, even if it fits uh, adequately, might not be the best way to describe the data that you've collected, right? So you should test between different uh, potential measurement models underlying your your responses. Um, okay, so obviously there's nothing stopping you from collecting validation data um, uh, at any of these stages, um, or indeed at a later stage, um, uh, having earlier pushed back against the tendency in the literature to distinguish between many different kinds of validity, I'm gonna walk that back here a bit and say that it is good to collect evidence for convergence as well as for divergence, um, uh, and also for the prediction of theoretical, for example, behavioral outcomes and so forth. And uh, so many of us, uh, but, but many of us really only collect data on convergent validity, right? So we usually, when we're trying to validate a scale, we only check to see if our measure of, of for example, religiosity um, is positively correlated with other similar measures of religiosity, and then we kind of end it, uh, end it there. But, but this is really too low a bar. If validity is about the existence of a psychological construct and the truth of a causal theory about its relation to some inputs and outputs, then evidence of validity must cover more than just correlations with similar measures. And yet in practice, uh, most papers, most validation papers, really only look at correlations with, with similar measures. Um, on the other hand, look, like I, I recognize right, that, that rigorous validation studies are costly and effortful and that our resources are limited. I don't think that all psychologists, or more specifically, all psychologists of religion, have to be in the business of validating measures, but some of us should be. Um, and all of us can and should do more psychometric work on the measures that we are using. So as I said earlier, once upon a time, it was just computationally implausible to expect everyone to run confirmatory factor analyses on all their scales. But that's just not true anymore. It is now very easy to run CFAs in R or M plus or even SPSS. So everybody should do it. Um, okay, so we've come to like the end of my talk. I just want to leave you with two take home messages. Um, which, which I hope you already have in your minds anyway. Um, the first is to take seriously the idea um, that measurement is theory laden. Uh, the, the humanists in the room uh, will probably know this already more kind of obviously than the scientists in the room. Now, like, look, we, we, we kid ourselves if we think that in our measurements, we're simply making purely objective observations to test our theories. Um, right, so all measurement is theory laden. The second uh, take home lesson related to the first is that scientific theories should be tested. And this includes our theories about what our measures are doing. Um, so, okay, so, right, so what I want us all to do is to think clearly about our theoretical constructs um, and, 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 and then not leave these assumptions about them and their relationship to our indicators untested. That we should, be, we should think of our, measure, our measurement tools as, as objects of study themselves, as, 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 hypo, as, as having hypotheses built into them, rather than just as like means of observing the world in a sort of objective manner. Um, uh, and, and I think you know, Conrad said a similar thing about treating our definitions as theories, which also themselves are amenable um, to testing. Um, thank you. Okay, um, look, it's 19 past, so perhaps a couple of quick questions and then more discussion during lunchtime because we're eating into our, our lunchtime. Sorry? Um, I was scheduled lunch from 12 to 12.15 and so we continue at one o'clock with another. But still, we have round tables and we can discuss during lunch. So, you want to yeah. go to lunch right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, in that case, let us head off to lunch. And what we'll do is we'll all ask uh, John questions during lunch so he won't get to eat. Yes. Okay? I think that works well. Perfect. <laughs>